Project Management for the Masses podcast, episode 42. From Zero to Project Management Giant, the story of Dell Computers with Roy Gatlin. Project managers, have you ever felt like you should get that promotion or a better job? Start a business, write that book. Have you ever felt you were made for more but didn't know where to start? Welcome to the PM for the Masses podcast with your host, Caesar Abade. Learn from the experts, think outside the box, have a voice, network, and be extraordinary. PM for the Masses podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Project Management for the Masses podcast. My name is Cesar Abid, your host, and this show is your weekly reminder that your career matters more than your job, and that your life is a project and you are the manager. Whether you work for a company or for yourself, your job stability is really just your ability to land your next gig. So, join me in practicing intentional, planned, and value-adding relevance, starting right now. Well, here I am again with an episode of the PM for the Masses podcast. I'm happy to say now that I'm now back in the game. As you may have noticed, it's been a couple of weeks since my last release. Things have been really hectic and, uh, and you know, as I mentioned before, <laughs> the baby doesn't sleep. But actually, things are starting to get back on track and the baby's kind of sleeping much better now. We are using, we're using this sleep plan that... Uh, we got from this um, person on the internet, and it actually works. So um, I'm I'm happy to say that I'm uh, you know back in the game. And today I bring you my f- uh, former Dell employee Roy Gatling, and he will tell us all about his experience at Dell and how they really embraced project management as they went from a group of only 50 team members to the massive powerhouse that they are today. So, how about we get started? Special guest coming up next, pmforthemasses.com, pmforthemasses.com. Roy Gatlin was one of the pioneers that was part of the success story that we know as Dell Computer Corporation. Roy joined that little startup in Texas when it employed less than 50 people, and he experienced history-making growth as it became a global Fortune 100 company with over $60 billion in revenue. Roy has nearly 20 years of combined project management experience in hardware development, software development, IT, and mergers and acquisitions. He has worked in an environment with absolutely no process in place and one with perhaps a bit too much process in place. And based on his experience and his entrepreneurial roots, Roy recently launched his own project management consulting practice based in Austin, Texas, where he joins us today. Good evening, Roy. How are you? Oh, Caesar, I'm I'm doing great and I'm really, really pleased to be on your podcast. Thank you. Oh no, thank you for being here. I know you're busy, you know you're you have lots to share, so I'm excited to have you on the show. So we can, uh, it's, this episode is almost like a follow-up to my introduction to Agile, because I think we're going to touch on that topic here and there. So, uh, well, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I uh, am an avid uh, listener, and uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you by an email or something that I, I uh, first came across your podcast while I was in San Diego not long ago. And it certainly made my walks uh, uh, through Balboa Park a lot more, well, not only interesting, but uh, educational. So I, I thank you for the work that you're doing. I think the whole PM community is uh, grateful for what you're doing there. Ah, thank you. And uh, if I can make San Diego even cooler, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, and uh, and I was just telling you, you know, we, we I, I produced the show and I put it out there and I never know where it's going to land, who's going to catch it. And uh, and it's great to hear that uh, that that you found it, and that you enjoy it. So and now you're you're on the show. So there you go. That's awesome. I'm thrilled. OK, right. So um, you have a very interesting um, career, a very interesting story in the in the project management industry. Do you mind sharing uh, with us how you got started and and um, and how you got to be where you are today? Sure, uh, happy to. Well, uh, how I got started, you know, I'm going to go uh, a pretty far back in time and um, and tell you a little bit about how I well, I think it was my first experience with project management. Although at the time, 
I had no idea that's what I was doing. Uh, so uh, my father was a home builder, and um, he built uh, custom homes, track homes. He built a few motels and some apartments and things. Uh, and anyway, uh, when I was about 13, he put me to work uh, as just you know nothing but manual labor. And uh, for the longest time, I resented him for doing that. And I resented him doing that. And, and uh, uh, later on in life, I came to really appreciate uh, what he did for me. Uh, so I, I uh, was out there, you know, busting up curbs, uh, loading up trash, hauling sheetrock around. I mean, it was just it was hard work in the uh, South Texas sun. But uh, it certainly uh, taught me, um, you know, a bit about hard work. It also taught me that air conditioning is a wonderful thing, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I, um, I, uh, you know, figured that ultimately I would do something where I wasn't necessarily out in the hot sun all day long, but I do have a great appreciation for uh, construction, and uh, I'm certain have continued to be interested in it and, and real estate as well. Now, uh, to get to the story about project management, uh, when. Um, between, uh, I guess, my 18th and 19th birthday, I was actually out in California. Uh, my parents were uh, divorced at the time, and, and my mother was out there, and she asked me to come and visit and, and help her move from Southern California to Northern California. So I flew out there and did that. And uh, I fully intended to stay there and go to college out on the West Coast. Uh, during that time, uh, my father um, called, and, and uh, to make a long story short, he was, uh, he was critically ill, and so I flew back to Texas, and I had to finish up uh, a number of homes that were underway. There were some projects that were going on. Uh, two of them were custom homes, and doing a custom home, I mean, I know you're in the construction business, but uh, that's, uh, that's not something you can just do any old way you feel like. Uh, you're doing that for a specific customer. Uh, and uh, you know, doing very specific things for them, so they have a keen interest in making sure it's done right. Well, here I am, you know, not quite 19 years old, having to take over basically uh, for this business, and so I got thrown into uh, a, a role that was essentially uh, project management. Uh, at, you know, back in that time and. And in that business, we referred to that as being a superintendent or, you know, basically a supervisor, something of that nature. Now, fortunately, I had a good relationship with much of the crew who had been with my father for many, many years. I mean, they had known me as a kid, you know, working out, out uh, during the summers with them. And so, um, so that helped. But I had to take on this role of scheduling, you know, material delivery, scheduling con subcontractors, scheduling, uh, inspections, all number of things. And, uh, and um, you know, frankly, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But somehow I made, uh, made uh, my way through that, and the projects got completed. Uh, the customers uh, actually were happy, and uh, they were done. And I moved to Austin. So we'll fast forward a few years. Um, I ended up going to a, a, you know, a technical school, it, uh, it was not a, you know, a four-year college or a four-year degree, uh, and it was more about um, electronics, more about the, the hardware side. I had an interest in that from the time I was a teenager because I liked music, and I've, I've played music since then, and I liked amplifiers and stereos and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in any event, I ended up in the computer biz uh, through that. Uh, I had actually had an interest in computers, and, and even during that time I was going to technical school, I, I bought a TRS-80, and I was doing some basic programming, and so I, I, I liked this stuff. I ended up in the computer business, and um, uh, I started out with a company called Sperry Univac, and that's known as Unisys today. But from there, after a few years, um, I ended up uh, doing some what we would call IT work today. At the time, it was certainly not called that. Um, if uh, I, I think back that far, it might have been known as information systems or something like that. But in any event, uh, I was still involved in computers. Uh, and that had to do with the construction industry. And Austin went through a real estate bust back then. And so a number of layoffs occurred. So I'm out there looking for a job. And I see an ad in the newspaper 
Uh, I hope people remember what those uh, those things are. <laughs> but I saw, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a, um, a company called PCs Limited. And they were looking for salespeople and what have you. And I thought, man, you know, I just need a job. I'm going to go. I'm going to go apply. So I did. And um, uh, a young woman there was interviewing me. And she saw my resume that I had um, a little bit of a technical background. I knew things. And I says, have you talked to anybody in technical support? Uh, I said, nope, but I'm happy to. I did. They took a look at my resume. They asked me on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, what do you think you are on a technical level? I said, a 10. And the guy kind of looked at me for a minute like, mm, and he said, okay. And then they hired me. So I started at PCs Limited, which was the initial incarnation of Dell Computer. Uh, there were less than 50 people there. And uh, Michael was an uh, you know, 18-year-old kid uh, running the show. So uh, fast forward a few more years, and I've worked in tech support. I've managed tech support, and I've done a number of things. And Dell had reached a point where it was starting to, to actually design and develop its own computers. A lot of people think that Dell's always just bought them off the shelf and rebranded them such, and that's not entirely true. Um, and so we had some uh, hardware engineers that were uh, you know, working in the company, and they were basically uh, running those projects. Now, at that time, uh, Dell had no project managers. There was, there was nothing there. Uh, in fact, I'm going to kind of tell you the, like I would the Genesis story, right? And you go way back. You know, in the beginning, the process world at Dell was formless and empty, and you know, darkness was over the surface of the development world. And, and the uh, spirit of Michael. Uh, yeah, yeah, and finally they said, hey, let there be process. <laughs> and then there was a wave of consultants that came in. And so... Uh, you know, there was no process. There was nothing. There was just uh, three of us that got chosen to go off and, and basically um, kind of figure it out for a while. But they ultimately hired some consultants to come in. Uh, they had a wave of them come through. They evaluated a number of different methods, a number of different consultants. They came in and uh, established uh, a process. Just, and, a, just a parenthesis. So huh? when they brought in the, uh, the consultants and they, they basically just had a realization that they needed help, how big was the company then? You know, that the company then was probably, I'm going to guess it was uh, probably around, uh, probably between 5,000 people, maybe 6,000 people, something like that. I mean, it's a fairly large company. Wow, okay. You know, so uh, I mean, I would call it a a, a pretty good sized company. And what's the when when was this? Uh, what year was uh, this? It was roughly? in the in the like ninety three, ninety four, something like that. Nineteen ninety three, nineteen ninety four. Okay, so the computer market was mature already, and and they were getting big, and they decided, okay, we know we need some processes, we need to mm -hmm. kind of do this better. Okay, all right. Yeah, so P PCs were definitely uh, coming. They were still expensive mm -hmm. on a relative basis, but. Uh, Things were happening, and but uh, there there needed to be, uh, you know, in essence, a common uh, vocabulary and a common method for getting things done. There was a lack of consistency, and the company had grown large enough to where there were a variety of development groups, and you know, everybody was doing their own thing. Uh, at the time, I was in the, what uh, Dell would call the peripherals group. And so we were dealing with things like hard drives and at that time, you know, CD-ROM drives and monitors and video cards and things like that. Multimedia uh, kits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there were other people that were dealing with desktop uh, development or laptop development, things like that. Uh, so they brought in these, uh, these consultants and uh, they, uh, inter they uh, implemented what, uh, what they called uh, an integrated project management methodology. And um, that's what they trained us on uh, and, and ultimately uh, developed what Dell calls the phase review process, uh, PRP for short. Uh, and phase review process is basically a, a phase gate or a waterfall methodology. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how we got started. And I think it seemed, you know, it seemed to make sense for a hardware business. So that's what the, that's what we got started on, and that's how uh, I learned. I mean, I, these consultants came in; they were there for, gosh, probably about a year. Not only establishing the process and uh, and training us on the process, 
Uh, they were even running some projects that, that were going on where we had a, a shortage of, of trained people. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that process became institutionalized. In fact, uh, within the company today, it's, uh, it's known as PRP 2.0. There's been some updates to it and uh, some, a little bit of, oh, I guess, um, um, I don't know, bringing it up to date to some degree. But uh, that's how let me start. Let me just press the pause button here because I'm, I'm kind of curious because you were with the company from 50 to, at this point, to 5,000 or so employees. And how how is that growth without structure? You know, um, how how was uh, managing projects uh, during that time? It was, it was very chaotic. I mean, when I got uh, involved, there were three of us that were the first three to be chosen to actually attempt to to manage a project. And uh, I don't know if we made eye contact in the meeting or they drew straws or what. But in any event, three of us were were picked to go off and do this. And um, uh, basically, here's the, here's what uh, what I what I did was number one, I uh, latched on to the lead engineer's shirt tail like you know like a dog you know I mean I just latched on and I didn't let go and and boy did this guy not like that one bit uh, I remember him going to my boss and and saying uh, and this is pretty close to verbatim. Uh, call your goon off, you know, get him off me. And, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, he was used to coming in late in the morning, stay late in the evening. Uh, he was certainly a hard worker and a very intelligent guy. I mean, he's a brilliant fella and uh, did good work. But everything that was going on with regard to the project was in his head. And here's the other thing, Caesar, and it's maybe uh, hard for uh, some of the listeners to comprehend, but this was at a time when uh, email was just, you know, barely around uh, within the uh, company. I mean, email was not a common thing. There was no access to internet, none of that stuff. Uh, in fact, you know, we would uh, we would do presentations on transparencies and put them up on a overhead projector. It's like it wasn't the digital, you know, documents and things of that nature. It was a very different world. You had to pick up the phone. You had to walk down the hall. Uh, that type of thing, so it was a uh, it was it was tough in that sense, and um, and it you know like I said it was um, it was a bit chaotic and and none of us really knew what we were doing, but the uh, the three of us that initially got started would would compare notes and attempt to help each other anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then the consultants came. They spent about a year. They man- even managed some of the projects themselves. And they implemented the PRP um, system, I guess you call it. Mm-hmm. And and then what happened? Well, uh, once once that was in place, uh, I think uh, you could say that two things happened. Number one, uh, within the PM community inside Dell, uh, you know, we got with the program. I mean, we were doing our best to follow it. In fact, I think we might have gone overboard to some degree. Uh, again, we were new to all of this. And we took a lot of things, literally, all of the training that we'd had, uh, all of the, um, the documentation that we had to follow. And I think for some projects, we were going and, and attempting to implement a number of steps that, uh, frankly, you know, didn't add a whole lot of value. But we were trying to be good citizens and, and follow the process. Uh, now, you had another set of people that really weren't in that circle, uh, within the PM circle. And uh, what this was, was now, you know, s- stifling things and slowing things down. And I don't need to do this and I don't need to sign that, blah, blah, blah. And so it was a, it was certainly a culture shock and it took some time to really, um, to really, um, you know, get people on board throughout the company. Uh, one thing that was done that I think really helped and that um, over time Dell uh, implemented uh, training, mandatory training that had to go on for a number of, a number of topics. And there were certain times a year when a lot of training was, was uh, required. And what they did was they made PRP training uh, required for everyone in product group initially. And product group is what most people call R&D. But uh, initially it was uh, everyone in product group and then that expanded 
to most, uh, if not all, the company, where people had to at least have a fundamental understanding of that process uh, because that was the way we were going to run our development, and, and, and that was it. Mm-hmm. It's, it sounds like you, ha- you, you had this bird's eye view of, uh, of not only the, the maturing of a, of a giant company, but also uh, how um, project management, um, you know, formal project management can help an organization and, and, and all the growing pains that, that go along with it. Huh? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, project management uh, can bring to the table is, um, is, you know, predictability. That was one thing that they were looking for is predictability because projects were, you know, <laughs> it was all over the map. When's it going to be done? I don't know. You know, maybe then, maybe then, uh, you know, and, and it was on time. It was late. You know, so it was all over the map. Uh, and again, uh, was team A doing all the things that team B was doing? Uh, maybe team A uh, was missing out on some regulatory items because uh, you know, in those days, um, a number of regulatory bodies started standing up not only in the U.S. but across the world and requiring things. And so there was an ever-changing landscape with regard to that and keeping up with those types of things and ensuring that it was uh, known across the development body and consistently uh, implemented and monitored, you know, that was, uh, that was something that was definitely, uh, that was definitely helped by uh, the process. But there were a host of things that were, I mean, just having a common uh, vocabulary was a huge benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can imagine too. Um, so, so after this is all done, so are you, um, do you have, are you a, a project manager within the corporation or, or what was yes. your position? Okay. So that mm-hmm. was, okay. Yep, I was. And then I ended up managing a gr- the group that was actually in the peripherals team. And then ultimately I managed a, oh, a ton of them, uh, many, many, many PMs in, uh, inside Dell. Mm-hmm. And so, so it started with a um, simple waterfall type of, the, the type of um, process. And um, did that change at some point? And how was that? <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, they continue to to have this waterfall process. Uh, however, uh, things began to change in uh, well, probably six years ago, five six years ago. Uh, you know, in the early days, Dell actually had some people that did coding, but it was on very low level stuff uh, on the computer side. Of, you know, BIOS programming, firmware programming, maybe peripheral drivers. This is pretty low-level stuff, not things that people typically see or, or touch, not, not the uh, end user or the customer. Mm-hmm. But uh, when we got into the, uh, the uh, right mid to late 2000s, Dell began to get serious about developing uh, server uh, systems management software. And uh, many of those people that came to Dell with that background uh, were from, or they had some familiarity with with Agile, or at least with different a different way of developing software than than Dell's waterfall process, uh, and they had been forced to go through this whole waterfall thing for a while. And and um, you know, for you know the audience, um, I, I've got to believe that most, if not all, are familiar with waterfall. You know, it's a lot of work done up front, and you get into it, and maybe you need to make changes, maybe you don't, but. Uh, uh, so much planning, and it's it's um, you you know kind of fingers crossed that you end up with what you really need at the end. Uh, it's uh, making changes in the middle can be difficult, and uh, but so uh, in about 2008, the the enterprise software team received approval to run a pilot uh, of agile methodology, and so they hired an agile coach and they held training sessions, and uh, initially it was development only. Uh, software testing was not incorporated into that process until about a year later. Uh, but at that time, Agile was adopted as the software development methodology at Dell. So, uh, you know, it was initially a pilot. Gradually, the size of the projects, the number of projects began to grow. And uh, But now you've got software that runs on that hardware, and sometimes they launch together. Hmm. And so for software that launches together on hardware, there's really an intersection of Agile and Waterfall. 
where basically you have an iterative planning cycle uh, within the waterfall team and a waterfall phase. Uh, so the hardware design and the schedule are used as inputs uh, into the software release planning. And the software team will identify you know, some user stories that have uh, external dependencies. They'll update the release, release plan and then they'll, they'll interlock them on any misalignment on the schedule or what have you. And then they'll iterate until all the dependencies are, are, are resolved. Yeah, that sounds interesting. That uh, a bit of a challenge there, and not only that, it sounds like it. Uh, this uh, the the agile methodology that the, the, this coach developed, and it's uh, kind of um, outside of the the PRP um, the system that you guys had. And so, uh, did that impact the company in terms of you know now you have the agile silo and the, the waterfall silo, and now they have to communicate and they don't speak the same language. Well, yeah, it's true. You know, I, I uh, uh, for a while I used to I, I sat next to a, a PM that was dealing with with uh, one of these software development teams, and uh, she came from the hardware development world, and we would we used to talk about this this intersection is almost like a uh, a car wreck at times, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know where these things came together, and to get um, to get people on the hardware side to understand this. Uh, method where you could uh, iterate, you know, let's take just some some uh, features or some requirements, let's go develop them, test them, you know, come back, maybe add a few more, but ultimately we're going to meet up with you somewhere. I mean, to get people's head around that was, uh, was a challenge, and in fact, it's still a little bit of a challenge. Um, I think most people now understand that, that there are multiple ways to get this work done, and that a waterfall methodology for most of the software that's being developed uh, at Dell and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, you know, I mean, Agile's uh, a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's that understanding is uh, certainly flowing through. Um, but you got to remember, too, that unless you were someone who came from a software development background or really paid attention to what was going on in the in the project management world, uh, thinking about doing something differently, uh, so it was like you know if uh, why why do that if if we don't you know if we don't have to go and change anything, so it was a challenge for them. But uh, kudos to that team for getting it done. Very good, and it looks like you had a successful career uh, with with Dell, and uh, and you were doing well. Uh, you got to you know see firsthand the implementation of. Of good project management and being there for the ride, and it seemed like you you were doing really well there. But you don't work for Dell anymore, do you? No, I do not. <laughs> I left uh, just a couple months ago in April, uh, after a gazillion years. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I finally, uh, as my my boss there said, I hung up my spurs, <laughs> and uh, so I'm no longer there. So okay, so can can you share with us why and and how? Sure, sure. Well, um, uh, at the uh, end, the last few years I spent in uh, the mergers and acquisitions group. And um, prior to joining there, I, I was working uh, as, a, as a PM in uh, what Dell called software solutions. And I really, really liked that work. Um, and the reason uh, I had actually been, a, uh, I was in management prior to that. And uh, I had a situation where, man, I had so many direct reports that when it came to review time, oh my gosh, it was, <laughs> it was a, quite a load. And I said, okay, after this, I'm not going to be a manager anymore. I don't want to, this is just crazy amount of work. And uh, although, I have to say, I love um, mentoring people and, and working with them, and I really tried to, to help my team, and I think uh, they would say that I had some success at that. But I went back to being an IC uh, PM software solutions, and um, the head of the, the PM group uh, for that knew that I had an interest in Dell's mergers and acquisitions uh, efforts, and he basically had me in the bullpen. I was sitting there and, and essentially working on some things until an opening came up. Well, sure enough, an opening came up uh, in, uh, I think, late November or December a few years ago. And in the M&A world, when uh, um, a deal pops up, a potential deal pops up, 
Uh, I used to think that uh, some of the development stuff we had going on at Dell was fast. Uh, that was nothing compared to what goes on in mergers and acquisitions. If you want to deal with something that moves fast, boy, go fool with that. Um, so I did that as a, initially as a, as a representative of Dell's product group, basically the, the development side of the house. And I was one of the team members that would go out and help perform due diligence, which is basically, uh, I was the home inspector, or one of many. They went out to a company that we were looking to buy, and uh, we would go through a number of, of questions, a number of documents, uh, a number of scenarios, and come back and provide an assessment and a recommendation. And all of those assessments across not only product group, but human resources, finance, legal, et cetera, et cetera, would all get rolled up. And a decision would be made to either, uh, you know, continue and potentially purchase the company or to walk away. Um, while doing that, um, some of the work that uh, I had done um, got n recognized as, you know, decent work. And I was asked to, um, to move into an, what, what they call an integration exec role. An integration executive is, is basically... Uh, a fancy name, a fancy title for a, a, a project manager. Uh, but the integration exec is, the, is that person that um, sits at the center of the wheel, if you will. And all of these functional representatives are reporting into him or her. Again, the product group person or the human resources person, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I got involved in that. And uh, yeah, I, I really like that work. It's a bit different from uh, some of the other uh, project management work I've done, but um, that's what I was doing at the time. Now, why did I decide to go? Well, uh, first of all, I'd been there for a long, long time, and um, you know, doing uh, M and A, I got to uh, experience really, um, I mean, firsthand being back inside companies that were a whole lot smaller than Dell. I mean, the largest acquisition that I was involved in was uh, 2.4 billion and about 2,500 employees. The next one was 1.2 billion, about 1,500 employees. Uh, and then they got smaller from there. Um, and I spent a lot of time at that company that had 1,500 employees. Uh, I was out in the Bay Area and what was nice was that uh, I'd go into the office. There was one building there. Uh, of course, uh, some of these 1,500 employees were distributed around the world. But uh, you know, it was nice being in an office where we could, uh, if an issue came up or a question or what have you, a few of us would get in the hallway. We have a quick conversation. Bada bing, bada boom. We you know have a decision and we're on our way. And it was uh, there was a lack of of bureaucracy and um, a, a real ability to, to move quickly and get things done. And that, boy, oh boy, it took me back in time to the old days, and I, and I love that. Uh, you know, you come back to headquarters, not quite the same. You know, they're a huge company. Uh, at the time I left, it was, uh, I think, around 110,000 employees worldwide. Uh, a lot of folks. And you got to have a lot of systems and processes in place to manage 110,000 people. But uh, to get things done is not, uh, is not an easy task. I had uh, a lot of good success at it, but, um, uh, you know, at, at some point I just, I just said, gosh, you know, this, um, this could be a bit more fun than it is right now. And I think I'm going to take my chances on, on, um, on, on the outside, try to take what I've learned and, and see if I can go, uh, go help others, you know, with, you know, with some of the experience that I've had and some of the things I've learned. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so you've been out for a couple of months now and, um, mm -hmm. and on your website, you talk about viewing projects through, uh, a CEO's lens. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you mean by that? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's a good question. And, and what I mean is, um, 
you know, trying to take a step back and, and view and maybe manage your project as a CEO might view and manage a company. Uh, you know, we know that CEOs have ultimate responsibility for a business. And at Dell, PMs actually had ultimate responsibility for their programs. And, and were, in fact, we were told that we were the CEOs of this. Think of this program as our business, and we were the CEOs of that business. Now, uh, you know, it wasn't totally true. You, you couldn't do, we didn't have carte blanche. But we were asked to take on uh, this mindset. Uh, you know, within each business, you've got uh, people and products and services, and those are guided by the CEO's vision. And the CEO is faced with a lot of complex issues and has a perspective that includes the world inside and outside the company. And, you know, so the CEO has to understand how, where, and when resources are allocated. A CEO needs to know when to step in and direct the team and when to let them run. You know, the number of, number of uh, functional areas they need to understand is huge. You know, you, um, the CEO really needs to understand finance, uh, you know, legal, regulatory, development, sales, marketing, you know, the list goes on. Uh, and, I, and I'm not saying, you know, a CEO has to be an expert in all those areas, but they do need a fundamental understanding of each of those things in order to take a holistic approach and, uh, and ensure that, you know, they have the right people and the right products for the business to thrive. So a CEO has to be able to gather you know, the appropriate inputs, you know, make tough decisions when nobody else wants to or can. And, yeah, and sometimes the CEO has very little time to make that decision. Um, so what I'm saying is that you know, try to step back and think a little bit bigger, a little bit broader. Uh, consider a host of things that may be more than just getting the product out the door, getting the project finished. Uh, there's a host of parameters, uh, a host of issues that, that need to be considered. And so what I'm attempting to do is come in and view uh, not only projects, but, but teams that way as well, and maybe coach people on that as well. Okay. All right. That sounds uh that sounds very interesting and um and you sure have the the experience I mean you sort of, it's a lot it sounds to me that like you've seen it all from uh, all sorts of dif different perspectives and you even even got the, the chance to work with smaller companies from within this uh, gigantic uh, corporation that you worked for um, I'm sure you worked with CEOs <laughs> I, I did uh, you know in fact uh, I'm, I'm really good friends with a couple of the the CEOs that were companies that, you know that we bought and these people I mean one of them in particular uh, worked at Apple and then he ran an organization at, at Philips uh, electronics uh, in the Netherlands he had 56,000 people reporting to him I mean this guy was no slouch mm -hmm. and uh, He's just a fantastic guy. I love him to death. And uh, I learned a lot from him. And I, I think he learned a few things from me. I mean, our goal was to help one another in making this thing work. And uh, uh, so I, I spent time with not only him, but, but uh, the CFO there and, and people like him. Um, and uh, I, I got to meet and work with a lot of really, really uh, talented people. And, and uh, I am not... Uh, I'm not blowing smoke here, but I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've been in meetings inside the Dell boardroom with people that are at, you know, level, you know, the levels that report directly to Michael Dell. We weren't, uh, you know, bosom buddies and out uh, every night together, but uh, there's been many times I've shared dinner and a glass of wine or beer with them and had long conversations with these guys. So um, there's a lot of great education and input and um, just wonderful experiences that came away from that. Mm -hmm. So now that you're on your own, who is the, um, who is the, the, you know, the avatar, the, 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 the target, I guess, market for you? Uh, who are you seeking to help? Sure. Well, I think it's a, a, a multi faceted answer. Uh, from a business perspective, um, as far as the size of the business, uh, I would say uh, medium to small. Uh, I remember listening to one of your podcasts, and I forget the fellow's name. I think he was from the UK. He worked for the Royal Bank of Scotland, 
sort of a similar story. Francis Huck. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that podcast. And I, I and when I heard that, I was actually, you know, like I mentioned on my walk to uh, Balboa Park, and I just smiled when he started telling his story because I could, man, uh, that sounds pretty familiar. I need to call him. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so I think, you know, medium and, and small size business. Now, uh, I, you know, I know the high tech world. And so that's, you know, easy for me. Um, could I work in other areas or try to help people in other areas? I think so. But the high tech world is probably the easier target, small to medium business. Uh, there's a lot of that in Austin right now. Uh, it's just booming. And, um, and then I'd say uh, I'm looking to, within the, those businesses, I'm looking to help uh, everyone from the CEO on down to the, to the project manager. Um, you know, I, I hold uh, PMs in very, very high regard. I, I think a lot of times they're not uh, always fully appreciated or given their due. But uh, man, what a you know, phenomenal group of people overall. And uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's really what I'm looking at um, because I think um, executive management can uh, can use a little help at times, and and maybe uh, having an outside view of what's happening with uh, a project or projects, an outside view of what's going on with the team. And I think, um, you know, those uh, having, again, a, um, an outsider's perspective uh, can make a big difference. Uh, you know, I think we've all experienced that when uh, you come in uh, cold and, some, you know, you may need a little bit of information to just establish a baseline. But... Um, a lot of times it's easier for an outsider to see things very quickly than it is for someone that's right in the, in the thick of it, in the heat of battle. So that's uh, kind of what I'm, what I'm going after. That's very good. That's uh, very interesting. I, I'm, I have no doubt you're going to be able to help a lot of people with, uh, with your knowledge and, uh, you know, your know-how and um, just, you know, just sitting down and having a conversation with someone, <laughs> just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting all sorts of ideas here because I work for a small little company and, uh, I, you know, uh, it's, we can always use some new ideas. So I'm kind of taking notes as well. Now, um, Roy, um, for people who want to learn more about you and what you're doing, where should they go? Sure. Uh, they can visit my website and it's fresh. <laughs> it's new. It's, uh, the, it's www.projectmanagementceo.com. It's all one word. Uh, go to projectmanagementceo.com, and uh, you can find out a little bit more about me, uh, what I'm looking to do. There's a blog there. Uh, tell a little bit about my story, a couple of stories from the project management days within Dell, uh, you know, some other, some other uh, topics there that might be provocative. I don't know, but... Uh, but I would love for, uh, for the listeners to, to visit and uh, provide feedback uh, on, on any aspect of it. I really would. In fact, uh, if you allow me, I, uh, before we go, I'd like to ask three things of your audience. So you tell me whenever you're, uh, you're ready, you and can, I'll do that. You can go right ahead. They, they might not oh. answer right away because, you know, this won't be, pu be published for a few days, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, what I'm here's a couple of things, and I'd like uh, just some input on this. Number one, uh, I've been thinking about adding something I would call uh, instant coaching. You know, yesterday uh, Amazon launched a new phone, and I think on their Kindles and on the phone now they got this button called Mayday. Right? I need help, Mayday, and a human being answers and, and helps them out. And so the thought is something kind of like that, uh, but an instant coaching offer. Uh, low cost and use Google Hangouts or Skype for interaction. It's something like that. Um, so, if, you know, do, do people think that's a good idea, bad idea, valuable, not, you know, what, whatever, the, whatever the thoughts might be. Uh, secondly, I'm thinking of writing uh, an ebook. I have a number of notes on this thing, but an ebook on project management, but specifically within uh, the mergers and acquisitions world and, and really focused on. Um, what the initial funnel looks like, you know, deals that come in and then, you know, due diligence and integration. But, um, you know, and I'd like to really tell you how you do it, not just theory, but how it really works kind of in the, at least how Dell did it. Uh, I mean, I won't give away any trade secrets, but, you know, this is how, in essence, how things work. So just curious if, 
people would see any value in that. Uh, lastly, uh, I'm looking uh, uh, for ways that you know uh, my business or a business like it, a consulting business, could could scale. Um, is there something better than like Odesk, you know, for finding contract or con consultant PMs? I mean, it's you know, I can be honest. I mean, you go to Odesk, and it seems like they they take it to the least common denominator, and I think that P PMs deserve to be valued and compensated for everything that they do. Uh, kind of back to my point about you know, the, you know, PMs PMs are uh, for the most part, man. The PMs I met are phenomenal people. They're they tend to be servants, and they're looking to get things done. And uh, so I'm wondering if there's a place where you if you can find people that. Uh, that might be part of a, a a network, if you will, that could that I could engage with, perhaps. But in any event, those are the three things: the instant coaching offer, the ebook on uh, project management and M and A, and a place to find uh, uh, other PMs that consult or, or do contract work. Very interesting, yeah. And um, if you're listening right now, you can go to um, to pmforthemasses.com and find the the episode i believe this is going to be episode 42 of the show and you can um leave your um, your thoughts there and uh at the bottom uh, you know underneath the, uh, the the blog post that accompanies this this podcast episode and then um i'm sure roy will uh, uh be able to read it and then you can uh, you know continue the conversation there um have, those are some good questions and uh, i i i've actually wondered uh if it if there wouldn't be a a place for a, 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 a no desk dot com type site, but for uh, for PMs, that'd be a uh, that'd be an interesting concept. Yeah, you know, I I think so. I mean, there's some really good people out there, and they deserve to be compensated for what they know and what they do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think so. But uh, yeah, um, one other thing I want to add is that if anybody want would like to contact me for anything at all, I want them to feel free to uh, send me a note. They can easily email me via the website. Uh, Twitter, telephone, smoke signal, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd love to hear from people and, and happy to engage with them. Very good. And again, the website is projectmanagementceo.com and you will find links to uh, to Roy's website and a couple of other things that we talked about here today on the show notes for today's episode. Roy, thank you so much for your time. This was a delightful conversation. It was a privilege for me to talk to you and get a bird, you know, like a little inside view into into Dell and your career. It's a, it's it's an honor. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, thank you, Caesar. It was my pleasure. I, I tell you, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, anything I can ever do to help you, you just ask. You are listening to the PM for the Masses podcast. All right. I hope my, you like my conversation there with Roy. He's a great guy. He surely has a lot to share. And um, as you noticed by the interview, he's starting his, uh, his uh, consultancy uh, business. So he's eager to, 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 to meet new people. So I recommend you connect with him. He's obviously not only well connected, but he has a wealth of, of experience and a lot to share in a lot of different areas, areas when it comes to project management. So you can find um, the, the link to his website uh, on the show, in the show notes for today's episode at pmforthemasses.com slash 42. And that's number four, two. Now, before I go today, I'd like to share with you this one uh, very cool post that I saw on mashable.com a few days ago. The, uh, f a few episodes ago, we talked about getting jobs and, 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 and you know, breaking into project management and, and getting promoted. We are we're always talking about that here for some reason. So and, and we always focus on, on how to answer questions well during job interviews. But we, we usually don't think much about the questions that we should ask, because if you've been to a job interview, uh, you know, the, the, the interviewer will ask you questions. But then they always ask, oh, do you have any questions for, for me? Or, you know, they always pass the ball to you. And we never think much about what we should ask. Well, this post here really should help you with that. It's called the questions managers want you to ask during a job interview. And also you can find this link at the show notes for today's episode at pmforthemasses.com slash 42. 
I recommend you take a take a read and 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 uh, save it, put it away for that one special time when you actually need to go to a job interview. Very cool post. So yeah, so that's it. That's what I had to share with you today. I hope you enjoyed it, episode 42. And I'm happy to tell you I'm planning and moving forward with, with my book. It's a, <laughs> yeah, I haven't made much progress in the last couple of weeks because of all the, the craziness that's going on. But um, I'd like to tell you that I'm uh, you know, working on it. And also I'm planning a special podcast series to go along with this book launch and idea. So stay tuned. It's going to be kind of cool and exciting. And, uh, and that's it. And I'll talk to you today. I'll talk to you today. I'll talk to you next week. And until then, remember that life is a project and you, my friend, are the manager. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening to the PM for the Masses podcast. Tune in next week for more great ideas on how to manage your projects better and truly stand out in your industry. PM for the Masses.com.